So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this session at the EuroPCR eCourse 2020. This session is entitled um, TAVI Implantation Optimization, Practical Aspects of the CUSP Overlap Technique. My name is Darren Mylott. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Galway University Hospital in Ireland, and I'm delighted to be joined for this session uh, by Hermel Gada, who's an interventional cardiologist and head of the Structural Heart Program at UPMC Pinnacle in Harrisburg in Pennsylvania. The objectives of the session today are to discuss the theory behind, and more importantly, the practical aspects of the cusp overlap technique, and to tell us how to uh, introduce this technique to, and the implications of introducing this technique uh, on particular aspects such as permanent pacemaker rate. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's uh, ask Kermal. Maybe you could tell us about what is the cusp overlap technique and, and, and what are the benefits surrounding this particular technique? Thanks, Darren. It's a real pleasure to be in this session with you. And I think we can go forward with the slides, actually, and start talking about cusp overlap. So when we start thinking about what this technique is, we have to think about the native anatomy. And so what would mitigate conduction disturbances is knowledge of the anatomy and being able to implant a transcatheter heart valve prosthesis like a Medtronic uh, Evolute platform uh, with full knowledge of the anatomy fluoroscopically. And so we know that a lot of the anatomy that we're dealing with is really the landmark is the non-right commissure. And that's the most important. Below the non-right commissure, we have the membranous septum where the conduction system is basically sheathed. And underneath that, we have the muscular septum where it becomes much more superficial. And if we land a valve too deep in relationship to that non-right commissure, we would incur a higher rate of conduction disturbances. So really, we want to find a view that optimizes our visualization of the non-right commissure and the true insertion of the non-coronary cusp. And so we know that the non-coronary cusp is critically important with these valve deployments. And it turns out that when you isolate the non-coronary cusp and overlap, cusp overlap, the left and right coronary cusps, you actually have an untrammeled view of the non-right commissure and the conduction system that's beneath it. So Hamal, what you're suggesting there really is that by isolating the, uh, the non-coronary cusp that we get, we remove the parallax um, that we can sometimes have if we're in a different view. And by removing that parallax that we can be certain of our depth of implantation. You know, this is a critical point. And we kind of have an idea of what parallax is when we see it with a transcatheter heart valve prosthesis. But really the whole concept of parallax is the oversimplification of a three-dimensional structure into a two-dimensional imaging plane. And then losing reference to critical points of that picture simply because you do not have that z-axis that's present in your two-dimensional representation. And so taking your traditional coplanar view, how we were all taught to deploy these valves, non-right, left, equidistant coplanar. And we're basically going more in an areocaudal quadrant down the S-curve. Uh, so we're keeping the coplanarity of these dots, these points, these insertions. But what we're going to do is we're going to overlap the right and left coronary cusps, leave the non-independent. That's actually going to morph this three-dimensional complex structure into two dimensions and give us a more valid and reliable visualization of where we are in relationship to the true insertion of the non-coronary cusp. And so when we do this, we basically elongate the outflow track and we have, again, a great representation of where we are depth-wise with regards to the non-right commissure and the critical conduction system that's below it. The other great thing about this view, before I pause and get your comments about it, is that we're gonna take the stiff wire into the ventricle and is going to park itself at the apex of the non-right commissure. Once it does that, and we follow with the delivery catheter, we're actually going to be removing parallax out of the marker band without any kind of adjustment in the gantry itself, simply because of that view, because that wire is sitting in the non-right commissure. So I think what this does then is it provides a valid and again, reliable estimation of where you're actually deploying your valve relationship to the conduction system. But in addition to that, it simplifies the procedure because you don't have to make several gantry adjustments. We like to plan the view up front with our CT scan reconstruction, but it is possible to do this in the cath lab with multiple pigtails. 
So, Hamal, that's a great point that not only does the REO caudal view and this cusp overlap view give you a great reference point for the depth of your implant, but it also makes the procedure easier because you have the delivery catheter in plane. You're usually pretty vertical. You have a short, um, a short width to the, the other two cusps. And you will also have a great idea of where, your, um, of where your wire is with respect to the apex of the left ventricle. So if you're having difficulty and you want to press push on your wire, uh, if you're trying to pace on your wire, um, but really you get a, a great idea of where the wire is in relation to the apex. But Hamal, one of the things that I hear from people who don't use this technique is that, well, it's not very comfortable having the uh, having the gantry sitting on top of me. It's often very REO and very, uh, very caught. Deploy or how do, you, how do you transition to using this technique in the cath lab? So I think that it all depends on the size of your image intensifier and the body habitus of the patient. Uh, in most labs, you're going to be able to achieve pretty much 30 degree caudal with maybe 25 to 30 degrees REO relatively comfortably. If you have a steeper angle like you're intimating, then uh, you're going to have to take into account some limitations that would be related to your image intensifier and body habitus. And so what we then do is we actually get a near overlap view. So we'll march right back up the S-curve after we get our true cusp overlap and go to a point where it's ergonomically affable to do the procedure, but we still have a relatively good uh, insertion of the non-coronary cusp reference fluoroscopically. We don't have to be perfect all the time, but in our experience, about 85 to 90% of the time, you're going to be able to achieve cusp overlap. Um, and then those other 10 to 13% of cases have to cheat back up the S-curve just slightly. Um, but there's not that much error in your assessment of depth when you're near overlap. Okay, so you go to the cat lab armed with the view that you're going to use. Um, you, you come usually pretty shallow, REO caudal, uh, and you start your, start your deployment there. Um, what, what's your, um, your strategy as, as you start to develop parallax as the valve starts to open? Do you stay in that REO caudal view? Do you move LAO caudal? Or do you cheat back up the, back up the S curve towards a, a relatively shallow LAO cranial to have a look at that left coronary cut? You know, I like this one. Why don't we get back to the slides? Because I think we're going to go over all the things that Darren just elaborated on. So um, what I, I do want to take you through is that, first of all, the imaging definitely matters, OK? So this is our traditional coplanar view where the non and the are overlapped to a certain degree. And so you lose reference to the non right commissure and you don't have reference to that insertion of the non-coronary cusp. The view that we're going into is this cusp overlap view where we're overlapping the left and right, leaving the non-independent. And that is in a more REO caudal angulation. If we were to get a reference of where we've deployed the valve relative to the left coronary cusp, because we know that the left and right have differential insertions, if we want to get an assessment of where we have deployed the valve in relation to the left coronary cusp, we're going to spin the gantry LAO, and it'll be something around an uh, LAO 30 caudal 15 angulation. So after we get the cusp overlap view and we've deployed the valve to the point in a recapture, we want to check our depth in relation to the left coronary cusp, we're going to rotate. But in doing so, keep in mind that what is visualized on the screen with regards to the insertion of the non-coronary cusp is no longer of the annular plane because you've rotated off the S-curve. You've lost that key reference. And so if you were just to deploy a valve in this LAO view, then you would think that you're actually shallower than you actually are. And so the fluoroscopic plane is represented on the screen here, and we've rotated around the left cusp. And what happens is that the non-cusp drops and the right cusp raises, opening up parallax in the native annulus. And we add about two to five millimeters of error to our depth assessment. So the imaging is critical, but let's talk about some of the procedural steps. So you see this fluoro CT again, dropping the non-coronary cusp here, giving you an illusion that you're shallower than you actually are in relationship to the annular plane. So Darren, to your point, we're gonna put in some procedural modifications here because like we talked about, if we have interaction with the conduction system with any part of the delivery catheter, the valve, then our rates of conduction disturbance are probably going to be higher. So step one is to start higher. And so there's a centimeter of gap between the nose cone and the base of the valve housed in the capsule of the Evolute. 
why is it that we'd have to take the marker band all the way down into the annular plane when we have this physical material that can prop back the non-coronary cusp if we start a little bit higher? And so our practice then is to put that marker band and peg it pretty much mid pigtail and let the valve descend as you see in number two. And so basically as position one, usually holding steady, if not just a little bit of forward pressure on the valve, the valve will actually naturally descend down into the ventricle, allowing you a very controlled flare as the valve descends. This prevents the valve flaring too deep in the ventricle and you dragging it back and manipulating up against that. After we do this and the valve has flared, we like to control pace. And we control pace at a relatively high rate because we want to minimize ectopy, but we also want to stabilize the pulse pressure to avoid any kind of hemodynamic impact that would lead to translational movement of the valve. And so as you see here, we're left ventricular pacing over the Lundquist wire. Around the third node, we rapidly get up to the point of no recapture. Once we do that, we're going to check our visualization. So you had mentioned, do we check it in one view versus another? We're at the point of no recapture in number four here, and we do a quick shot in the cusp overlap view to assess our depth in relationship to the non-cornering cusp. It's very common to have parallax in the valve frame when you're in the cusp overlap view and not have released the valve entirely because there is a cant on the valve. And so you will get some parallax in the valve frame in that view. We do not correct for that. All we left line silhouette of the valve as it relates to the insertion point of the non-coronary cusp to assess our depth, essentially in relationship to the conduction system. Then we swing LAO, and it's typically an LAO cranial, LAO caudal view, depending on where the valve is sitting. But we like to open up the arch, and so we can see where we reside in relationship to the left coronary cusp. This gives us a lot of information, obviously, on the left coronary uh, perfusion uh, to see whether or not we've sealed the left side, if we're too high. All those things can be assessed on that particular view, which is why we include it. And then the critical part of the procedure, obviously, is to release tension at the very end. We're talking about a 30 second release of the tabs. So we were very quick and efficient to get to this point. We like to take our time, draw that wire back so it's barely out of the nose cone, and just do a slow, controlled, methodical release at the end. And so I'll pause there for your comments about the procedural nuances, Darren. Yeah, you know, that's a really nice explanation of, of, how, to, of how to deploy a core valve. Um, that we, we, and we do something quite similar. We, we deploy the valve in the RAO caudal. Um, we've become quite comfortable now in terms of just using that single imaging view. Sure. We, very often we don't go to LAO anymore, we just deploy there. But tell me, Hamal, what, what's the impact that this has had on, on your practice? Um, and, and after yeah. that, I want you to tell me how, how are people going to adopt this? Because very many people, they learn to deploy an LAO, they see that they get a nice shallow implant in LAO, but they still have pacemaker rates of 20%. Maybe you could tell us what, what's your experience what, since you've started implanting the valve this way. So what we've done with this basically is we incorporated it into the Medtronic low risk trial. It is the only way that we deployed an Evolute in the low risk trial. And we have an enrolling site in that trial. This is our enrollment cadence starting in March of 2016, ending in October of 2018. And uh, these are our single center outcomes. And so we randomized 128 patients, 65 got TAVR, 63 got SAVR. You can see some of the hard clinical outcomes there, but we were very efficient with the TAVR patients. And the reason why we were so efficient is because of our 30 day pacemaker rate. It was one out of 65 with TAVR in the Medtronic low risk trial. Whereas 10 out of 63 patients with surgical AVR got a pacemaker, why so high? In the surgical arm, while well, there was a very large liberal use of rapid deployment valves, and, and those are associated with a large rate of conduction disturbances that cannot be mitigated because we don't have the control that we do when we're implanting a valve like Evolute. So um, this actually is something I presented at TCT that we're writing up right now, and it, it is the site level variability of uh, permanent pacemaker implantation at 30 chronic low risk trials. So as we know, uh, at 30 days, the mean was 17.4%, quite a high uh, incidence of uh, permanent pacemaker implantation. Uh, and that's represented by that solid line in the funnel plot here. And this is a standard funnel plot, so two confidence intervals, the solid hashes versus the fine hashes representing the first and second. 
If you're a red dot, then you're out of the bounds of two confidence intervals. Now, we were the highest enrolling site, and uh, we were represented in the bottom right quadrant of that funnel plot. And so we clearly were doing something systematically different than everyone else was when we were deploying this valve. And uh, when you take out some of the other features that would have led to us having lower conduction disturbance rates, it really wasn't who we were putting on the table. It, we were putting the same patient on the table that everyone else was. And so um, this really, I think, is, is a level of evidence uh, in, that was embedded into a clinical trial uh, that we're now studying in, in several other venues. Um, really, I'll just pause here before you know we, we talk about where we're going with the therapy. But I think what you know we've done in the low risk trial is shown at least in our center that we were able to achieve these types of outcomes. But now you know the critical part here is amassing a, a level of data that signifies reproducibility. Uh, in, in multiple operators' hands, including, you know, inexperienced new to TAVR operators as well. And that's going to be my, my final question for you, Hamal. I'm really interested in how, how do we get people who have been deploying the, the core valve and the Evolute system for many years, who get great results with it, but are a little bit reluctant to change over to using ARIO call. How do we get them to change? Because what, what I've been doing when I proctor is, is asking them to go to the cat lab with two views. Go with your LAO cranial view and go with an REO caudal view, cusp overlap view. And just when when you're at the point about about you know that you're deploying your valve at the start, and then when just do an angiogram in both of those views and look at the difference. Because very often what you'll see is that the valve appears to be much higher in the LAO view and it appears to be much lower in the REO view. And if we know that the REO view is the correct one for the depth of implant, then you've got to. They, they, I think people start to understand. That, that the viewing is critical to the depth of implant. How, how are you proctoring sites and getting sites to adopt this new technique? Darren, I think you, you just went over it. And so really, I mean, what we're doing is providing them with the theoretical basis of it, with the understanding of the conduction anatomy. And, and I think that there's a reasoning there that, that most physicians are going to appreciate, that we're not doing something just arbitrarily, right? We're not swinging in some direction, taking parallax out of transcatheter valve prosthesis and saying, trust that. We're actually deploying relative to the native anatomy, and we actually are creating a relatively parallax-free deployment. You know, the marker band is going to have the parallax removed out of it. You're going to know where you're, the conduction system. At the end, when you release the tabs, and if you want to do a final aortogram, we go right back to that cusp overlap view. Parallax is usually completely removed out of the transcatheter heart valve frame yeah. when you do that final aortogram. So I think that there are a lot of efficiencies baked in. There's a fundamental knowledge and a predictability that's baked in that people don't have when they're using any other technique. And so I think the thing basically sells itself. Um, you just have to provide the theoretical basis. And then what you talked about with regards to the proctoring steps, I think that that's the way to introduce it in, in someone's hands who, you know, maybe an experienced operator. Kamal, that's, that's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you for your time. I think we've learned that uh, when we use the, the cusp overlap view, that we can really trust that depth of implant in the REO caudal, that it provides us with a, a probably more simple deployment and um, that we can then move LAO and check with the left coronary cusp that, that were, uh, were subvalvular or sub, and we really, given the data that you've presented from your center in the low risk trial, we really have the opportunity to everybody to get down to single digit pacemaker uh, implantation rates because this is not a challenging technique. In fact, it makes the valve implantation very often uh, much easier. Thanks for your time. I appreciate uh, uh, appreciate the, the conversation we've had, and I look forward to seeing you in, uh, in Paris next year for a for a physical PCR. Thanks, Darren. Appreciate it. 